Yeah, I'm definitely feeling very bullish for the next kind of 12 to 18 months, especially. I have kind of operated under the assumption for this year, 2023, that we're basically just replaying 2019 in terms of kind of market action, general sentiment, all the stuff that happened in 2019 that laid the groundwork and kind of like the bedrock for the bull market of 2020 and 2021. And I'm feeling the exact same thing play out right now. So if you were to take that to its kind of logical conclusion, you would say that 2024 is like 2020 and then 2025 would be like 2021 hopefully with a lot less fraud uh, because unfortunately there was a lot of fraud that ended up happening in in uh, the, the last bull market led by of, of course uh, SBF and, and some other kind of uh, actors in the space there's a huge amount of outsider and insider bullish catalysts that are coming for Bitcoin and Ethereum over the next 12 to 18 months Anthony Sassano laid them all out in a Twitter write-up, and they include things such as the Bitcoin halving, the Bitcoin and potential Ethereum ETF, the election year, and Ethereum's new supply dynamics and burn mechanism. For those who don't know Sassano, he's a crypto expert and an OG of the space, with over a decade spent in crypto. He's not only bullish on Bitcoin, but he's notoriously bullish on Ethereum too, with it being his number one investment. In his latest interview, he broke down all the insider and outsider narratives that are coming for crypto and why it's impossible not to be overwhelmingly bullish. Make sure to stick around to the end of the video where Anthony breaks down his top investments for the next bull market cycle. Also guys, if you want to stay most up to date on the crypto world, I send out a daily 5 minute crypto newsletter that covers expert predictions, on-chain data breakdowns and breaking news all for free. Click the first link in the description, enter your email and join over 10,000 others to become a better crypto investor right now. Now here's Anthony Sassano with why he's overwhelmingly bullish. I looked at the kind of the big picture here and, and kind of tried to articulate why I'm bullish and, and bucketed it into two categories that you mentioned. The outsider bullish narratives, which are things that the outside crypto people can get excited about, the things that are easily digestible, the things that we don't have to spend, you know, a whole hour explaining to people for them to actually understand what's happening. And then the insider narratives. Now, the cool thing about the outside narratives is that the crypto natives can also get excited about the outsider narratives just as much as they can get excited about the insider ones. So we get like a double whammy by being crypto natives. But on the outsider ones, you know, I looked at the obvious things. The Bitcoin halvening, it's kind of a, a meme or a pretty strong narrative that after every halvening, the market pumps, right? BTC pumps. And then, then we get a bull market within basically six to 12 months of that happening. And that has happened every time so far. 2012 into 2013, 2016 into 2017, 20, uh, 20 into 2021. So it feels like we're on track for that to happen again. But what reinforces the halvening narrative is the ETF narrative. Because if they do get approved, it's going to be relatively close to the halvening. So let's say they get approved in Q1, right? They all just get approved in Q1. Uh, it may be later than some, some people would expect, but they all have to get approved together because uh, if they don't, then the SEC opens themselves up to more lawsuits. So that is Q1. And then April 2024 is the halvening. So you have ETF narrative into halvening narrative, which is going to, in my opinion, you know, be very bullish for, for the market generally. And then the flywheel starts from there. Could you imagine, Anthony? So like BlackRock gets their ETF approved then into the the happening and then they're starting to pump the happening meme is like yep, i mean that's exactly. something that could happen right in order to attract they're gonna sell that to the new blackrock etf the thing about the etfs is, is that there's not just one of them and i think this is important for people to kind of keep in mind there are multiple uh, etfs and they're all competing with each other and mm. the start of the product is the most important because they want to show that they get the most inflows right like you want to show that you're the market leader so what are you going to do to do that well you're going to start now no you're not going to start when it's approved you're going to start now reaching out to your clients reaching out to your high net worth clients as well. And you're going to be telling them, hey, you know, there's this thing happening. There's this thing happening, the halvening, blah, blah. And you're going to give them the bullish pitch because you yep. want them to put their money with you as soon as that ETF gets approved because you want to be the market leader so that you can just start that flywheel of getting more money in. So that's a great that point. Is, I had not put yeah. that together, this kind of this stacking of, of timelines here, but you're exactly right. I, it it mm -hmm. almost seems like it's orchestrated. Quite, quite <laughs> really Some people said that to me. They're like, it almost seems like the whole thing's just manipulated. And orchestrated. I'm like, it does to an extent, but then you also need to consider that the four year cycle is also the political cycle in the US, right? Yeah. Next year's election year. I actually think Satoshi did this on purpose, to be honest. Um, really? So, yeah, I have a thesis that's never going to be proven or disproven, obviously, because we don't know who Satoshi is. <laughs> time but with election year. I, I feel like the, the timing is on purpose because election years are always kind of, I guess, like a pretty fun year. Let's just put it yeah. that way. I'm not going to get into politics here. And it just, it all lines up too perfectly to me. One is one um, word for it, Anthony. Yeah. 
you could say that when you're not living in the US. But. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think that these other things around it just act as more positive narrative catalysts because the narrative is what matters for the market, at least over kind of like the, the bull market period. The fundamentals don't kick in until like the longer term. And I think the narrative is going to be very, very strong next year, at least, you know, the outsider narrative, but also the insider one. But that's my general view on the outsider stuff. So I think that there are already kind of TradFi players getting involved with ETH staking, uh, to be honest. They're definitely doing it through the providers that KYCing them and things like that because they have to due to regulations. So you're not going to really see it. You know, they're not going to go with Rocketpool, for example, at least not right now because they probably just legally can't. They may not even be able to legally go with Lido, for example. So they're probably going with these other providers, maybe Coinbase. There's Alluvial that recently got announced. They're targeting more of the kind of like enterprise kind of stuff there. But just generally, TradFi loves yield because they can sell that product to their customers very easily because customers love yield. You know, there's this obsession that people have with yield and I get it. It sounds nice, but I have my own opinions on yield generally, but I'll leave those on the table. But generally, I think when it comes to e-staking, what people forget is that in a bull market, the yield is going to go up because we're going to get more activity on the chain, which is going to result in more fees, which is going to result in more yield for all the stakers, which is going to result in a flywheel of people being like, holy crap, the yield's so high. I need to stake, right? And we're going to get such an inflow of, of ETH stake. And I do believe we're going to get an ETH ETF as well. I don't know how long after BTC gets approved, we'll get an ETH one. I can't imagine it's going to be very, very long after that. And the number one selling point that these kind of ETF issuers are going to say about ETH is staking. They're going to, they're going to pump the hell out of staking. I'm very confident in that. I want to hit on that kind of like supply dynamic thing. I think that they have played out in the bear market, but they've played out in a different way than what people expected. So they played out with ETH going down only a little bit against BTC, this bear market. Whereas last bear market, ETH went down 90% against BTC from its top, 90%. So if you put 10 BTC into ETH at the top, you were left with one BTC at the bottom, right? That is a substantial loss. The difference here now is that ETH is only down 25% against BTC, this bear market, which is substantially different. Now I chalk that up completely to ETH's drastically improved supply dynamics and its monetary policy with the merge issue introduction and the burn, which has further, and staking of course, which has further strengthened ETH's store of value properties, which is all that matters for value accrual uh, at that size. Store of value and money is what BTC and ETH have going for them. And ETH has proven this bear market that it has achieved a very strong store of value property and it has not outperformed BTC, but only underperformed it by a little bit. And then going to- That's a great point. So you're you're mm -hmm. saying basically last cycle, and people don't remember this, last cycle, 2018, last, last uh, bear market, ETH got got absolutely freaking slaughtered. It got mm -hmm. destroyed along with all of the alt Bitcoins, you know, the altcoins, right? Mm -hmm. Of that cycle. This time it was alongside Bitcoin, a flight to safety asset mm -hmm. for crypto. Exactly. And it slurped yep. in all of that liquidity. And that is so different from the last bear market. I don't think I properly took time to reflect on that, but you're absolutely right. And then similarly in the, in the bull market, when demand comes back, I really do think that's going to play out in a really positive way for ETH because there's just not going to be that much ETH to, to buy. And the narratives for ETH, are really, really strong. Obviously, BTC has a strong narrative with the ETF happening right now, but I think I, I like to bucket these into two different kind of things. I think the ETF narrative goes into my bucket of impulse narratives, where impulse happens, the news happens, the price impulses up, but then it kind of fades away over time and it doesn't keep doing the impulses because people get over the news, right? It's kind of like, whatever, the news is the news. We bought the news, now we have to have new kind of news and narratives and the narrative kind of loses steam. But there's another bucket, which is the fundamentals bucket, right? Which is exactly what ETH has with its change supply dynamics, which play out over the longer term. And you can actually see this on ETH BTC, especially recently, you know, especially over the last 24 hours. I know this is short term, but this illustrates my point. ETH BTC went down because BTC impulsed up on the uh, Grayscale news, right? But then ETH BTC has just started kind of like cruising a little bit back up again since then over the last kind of like 12 hours because the impulse is kind of over. And now we're just going back to the fundamentals. So if ETH is going up against BTC based on fundamentals when and the demand is just there, when the demand comes back in, you can imagine a world where ETH BTC just continues going up only over time. And even potentially next bear market, maybe ETH is the one that outperforms BTC and BTC goes down against ETH and ETH becomes that kind of like top flight to safety asset.
Yeah, so my whole kind of thesis on an L2 summer revolves around, I guess, maybe two main things. The first thing is that L2s are finally here and usable, and we have big institutions like uh, crypto institutions like Coinbase building their own and making it really easy to bridge into these things. There's liquidity on them, there are apps on them. It really feels like a lot of these top L2s are just like L1 in terms of liquidity, the apps that are on there. Obviously, there's more liquidity on L1 still, but for the smaller players, definitely probably enough at this on these platforms. And the second thing is just fresh money coming in. Now, fresh money can come from various different sources. It doesn't just have to come from the outside kind of new money that's not in crypto right now. Maybe it's sitting in a bank account earning some yield and then they come back into crypto. Fresh money can come from other ecosystems and also from people who haven't actually come on chain yet. And that's my real bull thesis for L2. And this is the same thing that happened in DeFi Summer. It brought people who had never come on chain that were in crypto. Maybe they held some ETH on an exchange. They held BTC on an exchange and they saw what was happening in DeFi Summer and they said, I want some of that, right? So so they brought their ETH on chain. They learned how to use MetaMask and other wallets. They learned how to put liquidity into Uniswap pools. They learned how to yield farm. They learned how to do all of these things. And we got the birth of DeFi and DeFi has just kept innovating and growing since then. And I think similarly with, with L2s, you're gonna get the same thing where people are gonna be like, what we saw recently with FriendTech, they're like, I want a piece of that, right? I really want to get on chain and I wanna get in amongst this excitement that's happening right now. And I think that just by the sheer number of L2s that we have going live and that are live right now, the apps just scrambling to get onto these things because they know that's where the users are going to be. The ports of entry becoming a lot easier because obviously, you know, Coinbase supports direct bridging into base. It's really cheap. It costs like 10 cents or something. That's going to get cheaper over time. All of that is going to bring more money on chain. And also the outside money is also going to come in and they're probably going to skip L1 and just go to L2. So I think that that's all setting it us up for when the market heats up and that new outsider money comes in, we could potentially see a proper layer two summer where things just go, go nuts. And we could potentially see new layer two's launching and within one day getting a hundred thousand users not 56 days anthony gotta ask you near the end so what are you bullish on these days my friend well i mean always eth of course i think that's just like the table stakes answer to give but generally i'm bullish on watching the cycle play out the same way it's played out every cycle in crypto and i know we talked about this earlier but the reason i'm bullish on that is because i think that there's always going to need, need to be a shelling point for the market to kind of rally around or any market to, to kind of rally around and i think in crypto for the foreseeable future while we're still not very deeply integrated with tradfi our shelling point has always been that four-year cycle, right? And that harboring narrative that applies to all of crypto. And I'm excited to, to see maybe it, it have one last hurrah. Maybe by the time the next cycle rolls around, we're too deeply ingrained with TradFi and it no longer becomes a four-year cycle. But that generally is something that I, I'm just pretty excited about because I'm basing, obviously, a lot of my investing assumptions on this four-year cycle uh, playing out. But I also think that it'll be good for the ecosystem for next year to be a good year so that we can actually get some fresh capital in and use all these new pretty toys that we've created over the last couple of years. So there's Anthony Sassano and why he's so bullish on Bitcoin and crypto heading into 2024. The confluence of both internal and external catalysts, from the Bitcoin halving to potential ETFs and new supply dynamics in Ethereum, paints a compelling picture for the crypto market. Anthony's decade-long journey in crypto makes his view hold more weight than most. Now, if you want to stay most up to date on the fast paced crypto space, remember my daily five minute crypto newsletter is just a click away. Click the first link in the description, enter your email and join a thriving community of over 10,000 crypto enthusiasts. Anyway guys, hope you all enjoyed today's video and that provided you with some value. I'll see you all in the next one and as always, all the best.